Australia, welcome to Australian Book Travels and welcome to this week's travel video. Although it's a little bit of an extra this week, I'm taking you into Melbourne. I'm attending a lecture on Jane Austen at a private museum called the Johnson Collection. I know that I won't be able to video the lecture and likely I will not be able to video inside the museum, but I thought I would take you around perhaps um, in the area I'll show you the outside of the house which is the museum and we can walk around the area it's in uh, East Melbourne and also through some gardens I thought that might be a it, look it may only be a 10 or 15 minute video today but uh, it, it is an extra for the week I just thought I'd bring you along we're on the train at the moment we're just headed from Eagle Hawk to Bendigo we have another two hours to go and um, yeah, it should be a good day. I'm really looking forward to it. Fitzroy Gardens were originally, in 1848, a reserve of Crown land with a few remnant red gum trees. By 1859, the gardens were developed by Deputy Surveyor General Clement Hodgkinson and gardener James Sinclair. They were subsequently named after the former Governor of New South Wales and Governor-General of the Australian Colonies, Sir Charles Augustus Fitzroy. The gardens are bordered by Albert, Wellington, Lansdowne and Clarendon Street in Melbourne. The garden's design is very classic Victorian style featuring paths lined with elm trees, extensive lawns, structured garden beds and a layered landscape. An ephemeral tributary of the Yarra River runs through the centre of the gardens, with the traditional lands on which the gardens sit are Cullen Nation lands. This is where the Aboriginal clans of the Wurundjeri, Bunwarang, Wadarang, Tungarang and Jajarang people lived, hunted, visited, farmed and took care of the land and the river. There is a scarred red gum tree in the southeast corner of the gardens, one of a few that are remnant from pre colonisation. This tree is of significance to the traditional owners of the land. It is registered on the Aboriginal Heritage Register. Fitzroy Gardens is also home to many European and native trees, including but not limited to the flame tree, the tulip tree, the bunya bunya pine, Morton Bay figs, spotted gums, maidenhair trees, Canary Island date palms, Cape chestnuts and English elms. As well as significant flora, 
The gardens accommodate brush and ringtail possums, ducks, microbats, and rainbow lorikeets, alongside the night active grey headed flying foxes and owls. Beside the wonderful flora and fauna, the gardens have a number of significant and interesting man made structures in which to explore and discover. Cook's Cottage, the Fairies Tree, Miniature Village, the Historic Bandstand, Conservatory, and Sinclair's Cottage, to name but a few. Let's take a look at some of those now. James Sinclair was a Scot who, with his love of poetry and nature, worked at Kew Gardens in England. He had also worked around the world in countries including Portugal, Turkey, the Crimea, Russia and Spain. Sinclair originally moved to Australia with his wife and growing family, where he opened a small shop in Burke Street, Melbourne, around 1855, selling plant seeds. By 1866, Sinclair and his family had moved into this cottage in Fitzroy Gardens and had become head gardener. He died in the cottage in 1881. Throughout his life, Sinclair wrote many books on gardening and his beloved poetry. Cook's Cottage was built in 1755 in Yorkshire, England by the parents of Captain James Cook. It is believed Captain Cook lived with his parents in this cottage between 1736 and 1745. When the cottage was advertised for sale in 1933, Sir Russell Grimway decided to buy it, transport it to Australia via 253 packing cases and present it as a gift to the Victorian state and its people. The cottage was rebuilt in Fitzroy Gardens, brick by brick, all individually numbered for the event. Even the ivy that was growing on the cottage was shipped to Australia. The Gardens Conservatory was built in 1930 in the Spanish Mission architectural style. Measuring 30 metres by 15 metres, it cost £4,000 to build. Each year there are five separate displays within the building. From November through to February, hydrangeas and fuchsias give their colourful display. February to April, 
sees tuberous begonias and gloxinia showing off. With green tropical displays and poinsettias showing us their warm delights from April to July. July to September sees geraniums and cyclamens flaunt their dazzling blooms. And finally, in September through to November, we can witness Shazanthus and Calciolara doing their thing. No matter the time of year, this small yet inviting conservatory gives us the very best of displays and is well worth a visit. Plants. I'm very. Through. I'm just shy. <laughs> That's alright. I'll do the. Plant. Mm. It's absolutely beautiful. Okay, Tim. I'm just going to acknowledge you. You're doing such a beautiful job. Oh, thank you. <laughs>
The Johnson Collection is a small and private museum located in East Melbourne. It is a place where creatives are invited to not only discuss the collection housed here, but also invites interested people and members to special exhibitions, study days, lectures and workshops throughout the year. The museum began its life as a home to William Robert Johnson and was known as Fair Hall. Johnson was a prominent antique dealer, collector and a real estate investor. In 1986, upon his death, William Johnson bequeathed Fair Hall and his extensive art collection to the people of Victoria. It is here that I attended the lecture by Francesca Kavanagh, titled Annotation and Inscription, Jane Austen, Unmarried Women and the Austen Knight Family Library. Not only was the museum and its shop impressive, but the lecture was so informative and intriguing, giving all participants yet more reason to love Jane Austen and her works and appreciate her life even further. Membership to the Johnson Collection is available online, and I definitely recommend becoming a member and attending any lectures held at the museum, although you do not have to be a member to attend the lectures. This is an amazing piece of history and a wonderful educational centre. I really do recommend you visiting the Johnson Collection.